Jeremiah chapter 32, reading from verse 36. Now therefore, thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, concerning this city of which you say, it is given into the hand of the king of Babylon, by sword, by famine, and by pestilence. Behold, I will gather them from all the countries to which I drove them in my anger and my wrath and in great indignation. And I will bring them back to this place, and I will make them dwell in safety. And they shall be my people, and I will be their God. I will give them one heart and one way, that they may fear me forever, for their own good, and for the good of their children after them. I will make with them an everlasting covenant, that I will not turn away from doing good to them. And I will put the fear of me in their hearts, that they may not turn from me. I will rejoice in doing them good, and I will plant them in this land in faithfulness with all my heart and all my soul. Jumping to chapter 33, verse 7. I will restore the fortunes of Judah and the fortunes of Israel, and rebuild them as they were at first. I will cleanse them from all the guilt of their sin against me, and I will forgive all the guilt of their sin and rebellion against me. And this city shall be to me a name of joy, a praise and a glory before all the nations of the earth who shall hear of all the good that I do for them. They shall fear and tremble because of all the good and all the prosperity I provide for it. So that's Psalm 130, starting at verse 1. Out of the depths I cry to you, O Lord. O Lord, hear my voice. Let your ears be attentive to the voice of my pleas for mercy. If you, O Lord, should mark iniquities, O Lord, who could stand? But with you there is forgiveness, that you may be feared. I wait for the Lord, my soul waits, and in his word I hope. My soul waits for the Lord, more than watchmen for the morning, more than watchmen for the morning. O Israel, hope in the Lord, for with the Lord there is steadfast love, and with him is plentiful redemption, and he will redeem Israel from all his iniquities. Well, it is great to be with you this evening. Please do keep sight of Psalm 130 in front of you. And the question we're going to consider this evening is this. Do you fear God? How do you answer that question? Do you fear God? The renowned atheist Christopher Hitchens was once asked about the possibility of God's existence, and he said this, I think it would be rather awful if it was true. If there was a permanent, total, round-the-clock, divine supervision and invigilation of everything you did, you'd never have a waking or sleeping moment when you weren't being watched and controlled and supervised by some celestial entity from the moment of your conception to the moment of your death. It would be like living in North Korea. Well, there is a God, and he does indeed watch over every moment of our existence from cradle to grave. But is that a problem? Or is it a blessing? It all comes down to, in the end, what is this all-powerful, all-seeing God really like? Because in fact, you could say humanity's situation in a Christopher Hitchens sense is even worse than he portrays in that quote, because he doesn't even mention that this all-seeing, all-powerful God is Lord of heaven and earth, and he is holy. He can't stand sin. So let me ask again our question, do you fear God? I think for many around us in the world, if they begin to grasp God's greatness in the ways we've just mentioned, and also how we've treated this God, well, they very much should be afraid. And yet for those of us who are believers, I hope in a sense that our instinctive answer to that question, do you fear God, would be no. And that you'd have good reason for saying that. Because after all, one of the most common commands throughout the Bible, even from Jesus, is do not be afraid. And it is true to say gloriously 
that following Christ, we are freed from fear in so many ways. But then we come to Psalm 130 and verse 4 in particular. But with you there is forgiveness that you may be feared. I wonder if, as we heard it read, did that sentence make sense to you? Or did it jar, maybe, at least a little? Does that fit with our understanding of God and the Christian life? Because maybe you might have expected a sentence, well, one like this, maybe. But with you is forgiveness that you may be loved. Or how about this one, changing the first half? But with you is judgment that you may be feared. But that's not what it says, is it? It says here, but with you is forgiveness, that you may be feared. And notice the order. It's not you're fearful, but then forgiveness. No, instead it's forgiveness leading to fear. And in fact, the concern of this psalm is that there might not be fear. That would be the problem, a lack of fear. Fear here is a good thing to be desired. Even, the psalm says, the purpose of forgiveness is that it might lead us to fear God. Well, this summer, over the last few weeks, we've been looking, haven't we, at these psalms in this section called the Songs of Ascents. And these psalms were first sung by God's people traveling on a journey or a pilgrimage towards Jerusalem. But they don't only describe a physical journey. They also are about walking with God, that is, in our ongoing relationship with him. Because that's the Christian life, isn't it? It is to know God and to get to know him better. And these Psalms, and Psalm 130 in particular, want to help us to do that. So let's see what it has to say. First of all, the Psalm shows us that the Lord, the God, our God, is the Lord who forgives. Look at the beginning. Out of the depths I cry out to you, O Lord. So just imagine... You are sinking in that bog. You are going deeper. Everything is going over your head. You are going under. You are soon to be overwhelmed. You are reaching the no point of no return. That's the kind of picture here. You get that idea in quite a few of the Psalms, the desperate trials that God's people may face. Elsewhere, it's suffering or it's opposition. But in Psalm 130, the issue causing this is the psalmist's own sin, as we'll see. So in this psalm, we're not actually talking about the experience of the unbeliever. Notice how the psalmist cries out, O Lord. Notice there the Lord in capitals. You may know that's sometimes written as Yahweh. That is, this is the personal name for God that God himself gave to Moses at the time of the Exodus to say this was the name by which he was to be known by his own people. It's a personal name. And so as the psalmist uses it, it shows he's a believer. He knows the Lord. But did you notice that Lord in capitals is not the only way our psalmist addresses God? Now, what I'm about to say is a little bit confusing, but I hope we'll work our way through it. Notice at the beginning of verse 2, the psalmist also cries out to God as the Lord, but there you haven't got the capital letters. And then this lowercase title, Lord, That's what refers to God as the mighty God, the Lord of heaven and earth, as we sort of began our talk this evening. And then you realize that repetition comes throughout throughout this psalm. What I mean is look through and you'll see the title Lord in capitals and with it the Lord without capitals. And that pairing comes three times. It's there in verses one and two, as we've just seen. And then you'll see them both in verse three. And then look at verses Uh, five and six. Again, capital Lord, lowercase Lord. So the point the psalmist is trying to build towards is that the one who truly knows God, who fears God rightly, knows the one true God in both these senses, the Lord in lowercase, but also the Lord in uppercase. Don't worry if we're summing a bit as we go through. Let's hope it gets a little bit clearer. But let's see what it looks like in practice. So why is the psalmist crying out to the Lord? Well, he tells us in verse 2, O Lord, hear my voice. Let your ears be attentive to the voice of my pleas for mercy. So here's the cry from the depths. It's for mercy. That is, the psalmist knows he's a sinner. He hasn't tried to hide it. 
He doesn't make any excuses, doesn't rationalise his behaviour. There's a, no claim for mitigating circumstances. It's very simple. He's crying out. He's pleading for mercy. Now, remember, this is a believer, which I hope gets us thinking even already. How often do those of us here who are believers plead to God from the heart for mercy? Well, why would anyone need to do that? Well, look at verse 3. If you, O Lord, should mark iniquities, O Lord, who could stand? Now, let me ask you, what is the answer to that question? If you, O Lord, could mark iniquities, O Lord, who could stand? Obvious, we think, maybe. Surely we all know the answer to that. Isn't that just a rhetorical question? I take it most of us here do know the answer. It's not a trick. You do know the answer. But the question is, in what way would you answer the question? Or even, dare I say, how would you feel about it? That is, maybe as that was read, you didn't even notice it. As the question was being asked, you even switched off. And then as I dwelt on it, you thought, this is so patronizing. It's such a basic question. Of course, yes, I'll take the box. Yeah, I know, I'm a sinner. But it doesn't really affect you. You have little sense of any weight in that statement. When you say the confession, well, you hardly even notice you're saying it. But not so for our psalmist. As he asks that question, he feels it. He is a person of iniquities. And he knows that as he says it, God hates that. He hates iniquity. And so he knows that his position before God, his future is completely out of his hands. Nothing he can do. Because the answer is, should God choose to mark his iniquities in the sense of holding the iniquities against him? The psalmist knows the consequences just don't bear thinking about. But, but, we get another of these glorious Bible buts in verse 4. But with you there is forgiveness. And the psalmist is built to this. He's now showing us what it is to truly know God. So yes, we do know that he is the one true God, Lord, ruler of heaven and earth, mighty in power, that he's holy, he can't stand sin, he must judge it. And yet there are some around us who have some sort of grasp of that. They have an inkling, they worry that might be the case, but they know that, but don't know God at all, really. Because they haven't grasped this. Can you believe it? With God, there is forgiveness. This past week, I spoke at a funeral. There was plenty to say about the deceased, his career, his achievements, his quirks, his kindness. But I got that sense, as you often get at that funeral, everyone's mind was focused. We were thinking about deeper things. And we were wondering what really matters about a person's life, not just the deceased, but me, my life. In a cemetery just outside New York, there is a grave with a large headstone. There is an epigraph engraved on it, but you won't find the deceased's name. Or when they were born, or when they were died, or even any mention of family. In fact, there is only one word engraved on that tombstone, which is forgiven. And at the end of the day, that's what matters. Because forgiveness is what we need. And where we can find it, the psalmist tells us, is with God. It's been said that little sentence, Psalm 130 verse 4, is in some ways a summary of what the Bible wants us to know. Even of the good news of the gospel. Did you know there is a God, the one true mighty God, who is Lord of heaven and earth. But with him there is forgiveness. And our psalmist knew this. He felt his sin. He felt the depth of it. And yet he wasn't driven away from the holy God. But here he is coming towards him to plead for mercy because he knew that with the Lord there is forgiveness. So maybe you're here this afternoon, this evening, you don't really know God truly. You sort of knew there was a big God, or maybe a scary God, mighty. You weren't quite sure how you'd stand before him. With the Lord, there is full forgiveness. 
But that isn't directly who this psalm is speaking to. It's also speaking to those of us who are Christians. Maybe you've started following Christ, but maybe after an initial high, you're now finding it really hard going. You're beginning to realize all the ways that living for yourself is so ingrained in your heart. You're tempted to despair. Well, did you know with the Lord, there is forgiveness. And maybe some of us have been following Christ quite some time. And then still we feel our sins. Surely I should have progressed further than this. Maybe I really am going under. How could God, after all this time, after all he's done, still be for me? Because with the Lord, there is forgiveness. The psalmist knows this. He wants us to know it. With the Lord, there is forgiveness. And second, this is the Lord to fear. So we're back again, verse four, this key sentence. With you, there is forgiveness that you may be feared. So to fear the Lord rightly is where forgiveness leads. And so we are bound to ask, what does that mean then? To fear the Lord as a forgiven person. And it turns out, as well as the do not be afraid that come throughout the Bible, so does the right fear of the Lord. Back in Genesis, God is described positively as the fear of Isaac. Then in Exodus, straight after the giving of the Ten Commandments, listen to what Moses says to the people. Do not fear God, for God has come to test you that the fear of him may be before you that you may not sin. Did you notice that in the same sentence, using the same word, you get both kinds of fear. Do not fear, but also fear. Then you can think of Job, do you remember, who was commended because he feared God and turned away from evil. And then in Proverbs, we know that the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. Now, as we read on, we discover in the Old Testament, people sometimes associate the Old Testament with a sort of negative fear of the Lord. But it actually turns out the problem in the Old Testament is that there is not enough fear of the Lord of the right kind. So we're about to read a slightly longer bit of Jeremiah. This is where Jeremiah is both reflecting on what's gone wrong, but looking forward to what will happen in the future, what God will do for his people. Notice what he says about fear and what he connects to it. Jeremiah, God through Jeremiah says this, I will give them one heart and one way that they may fear me forever for their own good and the good of their children after them. I will make with them an everlasting covenant that I will not turn away from doing good to them. And I will put the fear of me in their hearts that they may not turn from me. They shall hear of all the good that I do for them. They shall fear and tremble because of all the good and the prosperity that I provide. Read on in the Bible and you can say, sure enough, God fulfilled those promises. Did you know who feared the Lord? Jesus himself. Isaiah foretold about Jesus that his delight shall be in the fear of the Lord. As so not surprisingly, his disciples then said the same. Peter tells us in his first letter, conduct yourselves with fear. So here's a theme running right through the scriptures. And did you notice, even in that very brief summary, what was connected with a godly fear? Wisdom, goodness, prosperity. So we're beginning to see that those who rightly fear God, well, yes, they recognize he's Lord of heaven and earth, great in might and power and holy. But they also know that that very same God is also great in wisdom, in goodness, in kindness, in prosperity. And you put that all together, you get a very big picture of God in every way that you realize it is right to fear him. Now, Psalm 130 doesn't really help us understand more about this fear of the Lord, explain it to us. We've got to go elsewhere for that. But what it does do, it shows us what fear of the Lord looks like in practice. The psalmist in these remaining verses now speaks from his own experience. Three aspects to this to notice about true fear of the Lord. First, to fear the Lord is to hope, verse 5. I wait for the Lord, my soul waits, and in his word I hope. The Christian life is about waiting. We already do have so much already for which we must thank God. 
And yet we are still in this world marred by sin. It hurts, doesn't it, in so many ways. We do lose out. We still sin. And so we look forward to the day where we won't sin anymore, where we won't feel those effects of sin so painfully. But notice what is at the heart of this longing. It's for the Lord himself. Not just for what the Lord will do, which will be wonderful, but for the Lord. The psalm says, I wait for the Lord. That's what fear of God looks like. Can't wait to see him. Because we do already know the Lord, but we want to know him more. We walk by faith in this journey now, but we want to behold him face to face. That's our psalmist's hope. And so verse 6 goes on. My soul waits for the Lord more than watchman for the morning. More than watchman for the morning. So imagine that watchman on duty, patrolling the city walls. It's dark, it's cold, uncomfortable, weary. You know what it's like? You can imagine they think, okay, another hour has passed. They look at the watch, just five minutes. And it's as if that repetition there in the psalm just emphasizes poetically. It's all so drawn out. It just seems to go on seemingly forever. And yet, of course, even when on duty, it feels like the night's going on forever. Those watchmen do know the morning will come. And so it is for those who fear the Lord. Just notice again, it doesn't mean we are afraid of the Lord. Quite the opposite. We are longing for him. Yes, it seems long. We are now in the darkness of this world in so many ways. It threatens sometimes to engulf us. And yet we know as surely as morning will follow night, the Lord will come. So to fear the Lord is to hope. There's more. The second aspect, to fear the Lord is to know his steadfast love in verse 7. For with the Lord, there is steadfast love. So many people sort of believe in a God, don't they? They have some understanding of a powerful being. But if you'd have asked that question, we almost started with, but what's he like? Well, their suspicion was that he's out to get us, out to catch us, out to punish us. And yet we who know the Lord know that he's a God of love. In fact, we know it even better than the psalmist because we don't simply have God's word of promise of forgiveness, which is great enough. We have seen how it is that a mighty and holy God, without compromising that aspect of his character, can bring about this forgiveness. That at the cross, while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. I grew up in a Christian home hearing about Jesus Plenty of stumbles along the way, of course, but I have always walked with God on this journey and I am deeply grateful for that. But it has been a journey at which I've developed. I remember my early teenage years, consciously one night, putting together the different pieces of the gospel that I'd been taught and understanding and trusting in that. But then as a student, I remember coming to grasp more of the seriousness of sin By that I mean the seriousness of my sin, that I deserved God's judgment. I felt maybe something of the depths that Psalm 130 describes. But then with that, I did grasp all the more that God had given his own son, even to death, on a cross for me. Many here will have had a similar experience, but as we see that, how do we respond? Well, with amazement, surely that the mighty, holy God, Lord of heaven and earth, gave what? His son for me. Such extravagant, costly love, the like of which we know we can find nowhere else. How do we respond? Surely we, well, we just tremble, don't we, at the knees in fear. A glad, a happy fear that a God so great would love us so. So to fear the Lord is to hope, is to know this steadfast love. And then thirdly, those who fear the Lord will experience plentiful redemption. Verse 7 goes on. And with him is plentiful redemption, and he will redeem Israel from all his iniquities. So redemption, that language of what God did back in Egypt as God rescued and freed his people from slavery to come to know him. Of course, we today have an experienced an even better exodus. We were slaves to sin, 
and Christ paid the price to set us free. The deal is done. And yet, it's fair to say, we are still yet to experience this redemption in full. There's more to come. But the person with the small view of God, the person that doesn't fear God, well, they suspect that, well, God's a bit stingy, isn't he? Won't really give us much. In fact, he might just take away. But our psalmist, one who knows the Lord, even in his hard time, knows, no, it's a plentiful redemption. We are never going to be shortchanged, quite the opposite. And then even as we hear that, maybe I'm thinking, well, that's great for others, but if you just knew my sin, maybe I will be the one that misses out. No. Final line, God will redeem Israel from all his iniquities. God knows what we're like but forgiven us for all our sins. The true fear of God struggles to take in all that God will do for his people. Did you notice again as we went through this psalm, our psalmist's experience? Notice verses 1 to 4. We saw the psalmist speaking to God in prayer. But notice how that has then gone by the time we've got to verses 7 and 8 to speak to others. Notice, O Israel. It's as if our psalmist's view is so great in every way, in all these aspects of God's character, that it inevitably spills out into sharing what he knows with others. Not here so much with unbelievers. The focus is fellow believers. He wants to tell those around him. And it makes sense, doesn't it? Because as we journey on the Christian walk today, there are moments, aren't there, where the going is hard. Not least when we become increasingly aware of our own sin and all sorts of questions and doubts spring up. And so let's take the example of this psalmist as we meet with other believers, say like tonight at a church meeting. Look around, everyone looks sorted and fine, but we know that's not true. Some may be particularly struggling. So make the most of this opportunity to be like our psalmist. What we know of the Lord, speak to one another of what it is to fear God. So our question again, do you fear God? We all fear someone or something. And the wonder is that a right fear of God takes away those other fears. Because some around us have a partial knowledge of God, only as that mighty and threatening being. They fear judgment and punishment. But we need not fear that, because with God there is forgiveness. Some are very concerned for the future. They fear that. But ultimately, we need not, because with the Lord there is hope. Some will fear loneliness and isolation. Ultimately, we need not, because we know the Lord's steadfast love. And some, of course, will just fear missing out. But we need not, because with the Lord, there is a plentiful redemption. Our psalmist wants us to realize that God is so great, so awesome, in every direction, in a way that is such good news for us. But as we begin to see the enormity of all this, we begin to fear God, not a fear that leads us to run away frightened of God, but in fact a fear that makes us want to go towards him with confidence. We can do that because with him there is forgiveness. And as we have a growing true fear of the Lord, we will become more and more like Jesus, that one who had that never-ending delight in his fear of the Lord. Let's pray as we close. But with you there is forgiveness that you may be feared. Father, we praise you again that with you there is such forgiveness. We thank and praise you for the wonder of what you did in Christ at the cross to make it possible for us to come to you. And so we ask that we would not treat you lightly in any way, but instead fear you as we should. Would our view of you in the ways we've heard described this evening grow more and more so that it would be our delight to be fearing you always. For Jesus' sake. Amen.